So Dominic, we're in this piece, which is a projected work, and it's also an immersive environment. It's projected onto the walls. And this is part of your endurance series. Endurance is a uh, part of my kind of growing collection of studies about the world around us and also very much about how we inhabit that world and what we are learning about that world. The, the endurance piece itself is very specifically about the Antarctic environment and inspired by the, uh, my readings of Ernest Shackleton's journals. It's a famous story, I mean he and his band of men got caught in the ice, physically crushed by the closing ice pack and then it became this heroic story of survival. But in his writings he picks up on something else which I think is really important today which is you know, he was talking about this, uh, this kind of hostile environment around him and of which he was in absolute awe but he also felt minuscule within that world to the point obviously his ship was crushed by it. And now, you know, we are 110, 115 years later, and these are still formidable environments, but also they are beginning to show the signs of fragility. And I think through the endurance series, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the viewer to assume some kind of slightly larger force within the piece, but one that shows how the human touch, not just their touch, but the overall human touch, is having an impact on these areas. And this work is actually interactive, isn't it? So you can touch um, and touch the walls and you can interact with the penguins and you can move around and actually be in the environment. You can, and I mean, whether you're, it's even controlling the sky, so I can kind of bring in clouds against, look at that, I can make it go all cloudy, I can control the lighting in the space, but I can also, where have they gone now? Here you go. <laughs> they kind of move around, that they will you know, run off. <laughs> Um, and again, it's that, it's that kind of, in fact, even if you look at the setting of this, you'll see that we're almost set within a glass box. You can see the snow is drifted up against yes. the perimeter of this space. Yes. So there is also that element of, you know, we are immersed, yes. but we are still very much the foreigners, the observers within the piece. All of this is digitally driven. You use your own code to write this. There's no photography involved. So why did you decide to go use the digital medium? I, mean, I grew up absolutely obsessed with art, colour and code. I mean, I was coding from uh, the age of very six. Uh, I was writing my own routines and so on. Um, you know, moving forward, so I think the, the, the incredible power and potential of working digitally and interactively is the image is, first of all, it's no longer static. Um, and even if you step beyond just that difference in the physiological impact the kind of glowing image has uh, on your perception, there is also this, uh, the, the introduction of time. And yes, duration. Yeah, duration. And having, having something that can happen over duration, over time, introduces the concept of loops. Yes. Uh, and, and things can reset, things can progress. And of course, what makes my works very special is they are real time. So everything is being created at runtime. The environments can never quite repeat themselves. The butterflies won't move exactly the same way again. Um, and to me, that's where the real magic comes in. Yes. And you know, the fact it's real time. And then the last bit for me is obviously you, the viewer. Yes. So the pieces aren't just being generated in real time, but they are also responding to the presence to of the, the viewer. To the in input of the viewer. And I think that by using this digital driven moving image technique, you actually are able to gain an increased power as an artist. It gives you actually an increased role. When we're talking about uh, contemporary times where um, AIs and there's a lot of debate as the you know, chat GTP might take over writing and so on, but by creating an interactive environment through the use of digital tools, you actually have a greatly increased role for yourself, but also for art in general. Would you agree? Um, that's very kind, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I agree that it certainly empowers me to better tell my stories. And, you know, you've got to remember that the technology is just my power to materials. It's the way I operate. Um, every artwork actually starts off with the sketches. Yes. It starts off with the story. Yes. So there's a whole ideation process that happens well before the technology kicks in. Um, but yes, the technology is what empowers me to tell my stories. But also what, what keeps me motivated on this is actually the idea that I'm empowering the viewer to be able to better connect 
with the concept and the artwork. This one is called World Stage, isn't it, Dominic? And this is, again, part of the Butterfly series, but it's slightly different because it's about a flag and about nationality. It is. So this kind of journey of using the butterfly to, to kind of portray the world around us. Um, I've, I've been wanting to create a piece about nationhood and identity. Um, and I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And I was kind of sometimes get caught in this eddy where I'm waiting for the technologies to catch up and my own technical abilities to get to where I need them to be to tell my stories. And I finally started working on the world stage flag. And then, I don't know, about six months in, we had the pandemic upon us. And, you know, because my process is digital and I can make changes, I went back to rethink about what the story was. And I realized that the way I wanted to depict the world stage and these, there's these icons of nationhood, this is about the portrait of a nation, is you know, if I could introduce the ability to kind of temporarily disrupt that icon and as we're talking, um, the butterflies will land and you'll see they land in the wrong place. So you get this temporarily disfigured flag. And yet, obviously, now that you know me, um, you'll know that my optimism was always that, that everything will go back to normal and it will reset. So the AI powered butterflies, each one is autonomously its own kind of, its, its own creature. I mean, that, that is what they are. They will, over time, negotiate with each other and the flag will always go back to its full, true, iconic state. This portrait, this, this kind of study of uh, the nation, um, I choose to present in uh, several different states. So you can have with the full color, you know, the red, white, and blue, but also, and you'll start seeing them kind of flying in. I, I bring in gold butterflies. And for me, the gold is, again, it's that sense of there's something quite alluring about it. There's an optimism to it. But and you can see them begin to come in. And I love this moment. This is kind of ravel of butterflies where the two, two pieces come together. Um, but when the gold butterflies settle down, uh, it's really interesting that you can still read uh, that iconic flag, even in the absence of its traditional colors. And you know, recognizing the fact that this is, again, it's a nation of lots of people. Um, the butterflies are reflective, so as you move in front of the piece, you will get a sense of your silhouette uh, within. Now the gold kind of leads us into this work over here, which is called Limitless. Yes. And this actually derives, well, it's a slightly different technique for you because you are using a feed from, a live feed from the internet. I am. In fact, I don't know if you can see, there's Limitless here, just off to my other side here, you've got uh, the Feeding Consciousness Tower. They're both inspired by the story of the Tower of Babel. It's a relatively short story within the Bible, but it talked about mankind trying to build a tower to reach God. I'm paraphrasing here. God did not like what he saw and introduced the concept of languages in order to disrupt the communication between workers so that they couldn't complete their task and, they, and then they were scattered around the world. Um, you know, the Tower of Babel itself has been depicted through art and through stories and literature uh, hundreds and thousands, millions of times, it feels. So with these two artworks, I'm taking that, uh, the story of the Tower of Babel as kind of a starting concept, partly for what it stood for as a story, but also the physical aspect of it, which is architect me, fascinated with shapes and form, I really wanted to kind of play homage to, to, to the collective story and experience. What Limitless is, is a live data artwork. This is a real-time artwork um, about the FTSE 100 stock index. So at its most simple form, um, it is live data visualization of the stock market. And as such, it can be read. So we look, if I look up to the top, I can see the tower is ever so slightly drifting up, which means the FTSE 100 index is going up right now at this very minute. So I can see who's doing well, and then if we scroll to the bottom, I can see who is not doing so well, who's at the bottom of that leaderboard. Um, so in terms of ranking, it displays the, the, these corporations ranked. In terms of how well they are doing, that's, that's a relative ranking. In terms of how well they're doing, I can actually see that right at the bottom, 
everybody is actually quite shiny today. Um, and that's, that's interesting because sometimes there is a tarnish that creeps into the artwork. So people who are not doing well get a slightly more tarnished facade. Um, and even just finishing off on the data visualization aspect, even the depth of how, in fact, there is no particularly high volumes of trade today. But if somebody was having a high volume of trade, their, their, their kind of symbol would be pushed out more. Is that as you touch the symbols, you begin to re reveal the faces of the important people within those companies. Um, and that's kind of acting as a reminder that these aren't just faceless corporations. These are actually companies made of lots of individuals. And again, that, that act of connecting is very much a reminder that this is actually not just about the company, it's not just about them, it's about all of us. All right, so this is the piece de resistance of the exhibition, really, Feeding Consciousness, and it's a really impressive sculptural piece. And I think the physicality of this is very important, because unlike a lot of your other work, which just exists, you know, ephemerally on a screen, perhaps, this piece is actually sculptural and three-dimensional, isn't it? What this piece is doing is taking live data. This is right now, up to the minute, what people are talking about in the UK. So I take this data from Google's trending search topics, and we've got a really strange collection of uh, trending topics at the moment. But you can see Pac-Man and the Lego group is right at the top. And there's an ident unidentified flying object. <laughs> it's a UFO. <laughs> and that's funny, because I build UFOs. It's one of my, uh, one of my side hobbies. <laughs> um, what I'm doing is I'm taking this live data and you know, one thing that we know, I think we all know, or we at least we recognize by the world, is what people are talking about by absolute volume isn't necessarily linked to what's actually important. There is a disconnect there. And I am playing on this idea of the disconnect and the, the ebb and flow and the, the trending, you know, trending peaks uh, by taking those key phrases and then providing my own Effectively, it's, it's a, a bit more complicated, but it's, it's almost like an image search that is played back out across these 180 computers and screens. Um, and with each cycle of update, the tower is being updated because just like the original tower with the language, the disruption is continuous. It can never actually be finished. It's never going to be complete. It is always in this ebb and flow. Uh, but as we look at the tower, you, we begin to see this, you know, we're all used to this idea of the infinite scroll on our phones, the, the, that kind of incessant feed that we're bombarded with. And by kind of visualizing it and turning it into this really, you know, quite abstracted live collage, and, and even the topics themselves are deliberately scattered across the tower, so your eye starts seeing other meanings between them. Um, but what happens is it ends up being this continuous stream of consciousness of the country that we're in. And, uh, and in doing so, it kind of feels like it's kind of holding up a mirror to society of what we're talking about. This is Metamorphosis, and it focuses on swallowtail butterflies. Now, you painted these butterflies, Dominic. Tell me about this. Yeah, that's right. So these. Yeah, so first of all, the butterfly is this massively reoccurring motif and, you know, for me, just an investigation into the beauty of nature. And, you know, I've been working with the butterfly because it's this most magnificent kind of fragile creature that comes in all shapes and sizes, uh, but also around the world. They're different colours and the, they, they represent different, different things to different people. Um, just... Over the last kind of 15 years, I, I keep thinking that I'm getting to that point where I can't go much further with the butterfly, and then some new level of obsession creeps into my mind. And that's really what it is. It's, it's this obsession, and the swallowtails in particular is taking the study of the butterfly to the absolute highest level of fidelity, where right down to the individual micro scales of the wing, I'm able to replicate the, the way that light filters through a butterfly's wing to introduce the color. And of course, in a butterfly, the color we see is structural color. It means color that's coming from light. It's not color coming from pigmentation. 
Now, these are interactive, aren't they? They are interactive. And as we move in front of them, you'll see, in fact, you can see, you can see them beginning to move now as I'm talking. But the process of creating them is one of uh, it's multiple, multiple layers of digital hand painting. So I'm creating the individual s details, the roughness, those light structures, but also within it, even the musculature of the, the, the wings. So if I stand in front of the piece all together and I stand back and I act a little bit like a butterfly, uh, we can see that they will take off. And as they take off, you, in fact, if you watch Kevin, I think it's the yellow one here, is actually passing through to the neighbors. And he appears so on another screen. It is. Oh, there and, we go. and this okay. is part of Fabulous. that story of this is about butterfly. Everything is interconnected. This is my, yeah, each butterfly, and it's always a random one that will take off. But they are actually a lot more free than even the way they feel initially portrayed within their frame. Now, let's speak a moment about your frames, because you make everything yourself. All the coding is all done in-house, but so is all the hardware and the frames and the digital system behind it. I have a studio of uh, about 25 people. Um, it's taken a long time to grow the studio, grow the team, but also grow their expertise. Um, but it's my training as an architect has always led me down this route that every single element that can be controlled, probably should be controlled. Um, and for me, that extends right down to the fabrication and design of what I call my canvases. And yes. these are purpose-made, purpose-designed, custom-built screens with my own electronics within, running my own code. Uh, and all of that is created. And it's kind of, the hardware is kind of an art form in its own right. But for me, it is an art form that allows me to have the canvas to do my art. It supports it, it supports very, and very beautifully support, too. Support, but totally intertwined. There is no longer any real separation between the artworks and their, their materials. This is part of a work called Dioramas of the Divine. Now, where did the idea for this come from? Because this, to me, really draws on concepts of the sublime going right back to the 1800s. It does. Well, actually, the story for me starts uh, also with looking at some of the great, great uh, Greek gods and titans from the past. And uh, in fact, if you look around the space, you can see Poseidon. He's, he's just seen me uh, looking at him, so he's kind of trying to get back into his iconic pose. We've got Poseidon, we've got Zeus, and we also have Atlas. And actually, if we come over to Atlas, I think, if we're OK roaming. <laughs> What, what I've been doing is I've been taking these uh, incredible icons, these legends, which really are stories that have been passed down through the generations. Um, yeah, he's looking disapproving. He looks like there, a classical statue made out of marble. And they are. I'm not trying to create humanized puppets of the characters. What I'm trying to do is humanize the actual monument of, in this case, Atlas himself. So I depict him kind of in his stone. He's, he's quite a solid person. But if you think about their lives, he spent all this time, he's tr he, you know, he, Atlas was kind of sentenced to hold up the heavens and keep them away from Earth. So he's often depicted with that globe. But for me, the globe is this, uh, you know, he normally he's depicted holding it up high above his head. But as we watch him, he's getting really excited by me being here. I'll give him some space <laughs> and then he will, yeah, there, yeah, bye. Um, so, so he's always depicted kind of in, in this kind of classical pose and all these characters you begin to see that actually it's quite tiring. So that, that process of humanizing them, lets them, you see them tap their feet, you see them get a bit nervous, watch the time. You see even when they're in those position, their muscles, there you go, his muscles will be shaking there, but it's actually really hard work. And mm -hmm. I, what I want to do is I want to connect their stories to where we are right now. And by humanizing them, I think, and if you take the case of Atlas, we can all relate to the idea of holding the weight of the world on our shoulders. And that's, that's what, these dioramas about is it's it's not I'm not saying that we are the gods or the titans what I'm doing is connecting their story to where we are and then as we walk over to the landscapes the diorama for each of the characters we then see a moment of ourselves in them so actually if I just reach my arms out here you can see that I'm beginning to eat away at the clouds so my my silhouette is being projected forwards into the piece um, and in my work, I do like to have that element of, I guess, kind of playing God, right? I mean, our, we are controlling big scenes of nature. As you look at this, you can begin to, you can touch the birds, 
that you begin to see this quite classical con uh, concept. And you mentioned the word sublime, and I think there is this element of highly romanticized kind of sunsets and, and depictions. I mean, even the, the earth that's, and, and I, I want, I'm not gonna call it the earth, I want people to presume it might be the earth. Um, have I given that way by calling it the earth? I don't know. Um, but actually it's kind of a hybrid of various city layouts. So you've got, in this case, Paris, London, New York, and Shanghai, all interwoven, their landmarks appearing over the horizon and moving towards us. And the time of day changes, it kind of dusk falls, doesn't it? It does, and we can accelerate time. So I can actually give the sun a bit of a push to go down below the horizon, and here we are in the night time. And this is where we see a bit more of the connection to Atlas. So even just moving side to side, you'll see the kind of gravity of the, the star trails is, is moving with me. And again, it's this idea of storytelling within the piece. 